Uh, thank you for your kind remarks. Uh, I, uh, as Bjorn said, uh, we met each other, uh, I think, in 85. I was uh, visiting Stanford for a couple of years. And uh, I think I was just about leaving when Bjorn showed up as a graduate student. Of course, he was always uh, a superstar at Stanford. So, so it's, uh, I've been watching his career. And, uh, and uh, we're very proud of Stanford to see some of our uh, students doing so well. So I'm very, very happy to be invited here for the Access Lecture. And, uh, um, and today's topic, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of it's going to be a bit vague because I'm trying to deal with a very complicated problem. But uh, what I'm trying to capture today is, is, uh, is the fact that uh, capacity in wireless networks is going to grow enormously. Uh, the need going to have, is, going, is there. And I'm going to give some ideas about, you know, what are the problems in growing that capacity and what might be ways to try and overcome it. By no means I have, I have any answers or any right answers, but most, mostly in exploration, I hope I'll get some questions and we can sort of talk about it together. <clears throat> so, so, of course, uh, this is just a picture to say, say that uh, we have finally landed up with, uh, with mobile internet devices in our, uh, in, our, in, our, in our pockets. But the history goes back, of course, to, to computing back in the 1960s and 70s, and uh, I, I was, uh, I'm old enough to sort of using those big machines back, back in India when you submit this big deck of cards. We would give it one day and come back next day for the results, and some of you might have done the same thing here. And then, of course, we went on to buy to get to, into, into, into PCs and laptops, but the big break came with, with internet and web, web, and that, was, that really opened up uh, the power of these computing platforms, and all of us started using them. And phones, of course, came uh, in the 80s. Uh, I think uh, Sweden was a, was a pioneer in that area. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, and I certainly everything changed when, uh, when Apple came up with the iPhone, which uh, brought in lots of new ideas uh, together, along with some very fancy sensors. And now with, with high-speed uh, data becoming available on the, on the move, we can also do entertainment, and essentially, uh, this is actually a WiMAX uh, 4G phone from, uh, from HD, HTC. But there are a number of 4G phones coming out. In fact, uh, uh, chipsets from my previous company are now in, I think, two or three phones and tablets, and LTE phones will be have out next year. So essentially, it's been a kind of basic, uh, mobile and computing have merged, and uh, we are now entering an area where where uh, these platforms are going to get uh, really very powerful, and, uh, and therefore the demand for capacity to serve these platforms will start growing. <clears throat> so uh, I was trying to capture here some big numbers, some leading numbers of where we, we are today and where we want to be. I think uh, uh, for the last three, four years, we were kind of... Uh, I'm looking at, if you look at WiMAX, we were probably able to do about 45 megabits downlink per terminal. A terminal could actually capture 45 megabits at the very, at the very peak levels. And the, the WiMAX and I think LT uh, release uh, 9 and 10 are about 2.5 bits per hertz per cell. At, uh, this is average, cell edge will be lower. And the round trip time RTT is about 20 milliseconds. And now we're moving on to the IMT advanced type technologies, which is really uh, uh, LT release uh, 11 and 12, and that just started, the standardization process has started. And, uh, and that should take us to about 150 megabits per terminal, so actually the throughput from base station will be much higher, probably getting close to one gigabit. And uh, I think the goal is to get about 7.5 bits per hertz per cell of spectral efficiency. So those of you who are not familiar, those are really big numbers. GSM, when it first came out, I think the spectral efficiency was about 0.1 bits per hertz per cell. 3G, the earlier version 3G, the release 99 and the release, uh, the, I think the release 2 and 3, were about 0.5 bits per hertz per cell. So, the, so HSPA plus probably is getting close to 2.5, a little lower than that. But 2.5 and 7.5 are big numbers. They're very hard to, sorry, to get there. But we finally have got there. And uh, the round trip time is about five milliseconds. Uh, this is what we're sort of aiming for in the next three, four years. And another, you know, another half a dozen years, I think uh, there will be some kind of next G, probably 5G, 
And I think we would then be shooting for one gigabits per terminal. And these are not these are indoor terminals. These are on the move. They'll be pretty small cells, of course. And uh, probably 12.5 bits per hertz per cell, uh, very high spectral efficiency. And uh, that climb is a very difficult climb to make. And the round trip time, about two milliseconds round trip time. So this is sort of this landscape where we are today and we're sort of moving towards. So, the, uh, so what is the real challenge that's going to emerge, apart from those numbers I mentioned? is the fact that we're going to see uh, lots of increase in uh, requirements of, band of, of, of data. So the data rate is going to go up, and I mentioned about that. And the number of users is going to go up, user density, because everybody will have a smartphone. And these phones will become much more, uh, will be much more active because they will support many more applications. Certainly, things like uh, augmented reality and, uh, uh, and, and mobile health, lots of other things are going to come on these phones. So the general view is the increasing your data rate, increase of uh, number of users, uh, the capacity requirements uh, in terms of per square mile capacity may go up by a factor of 100 by year 2020. And some people say even 1,000. Even so it's certainly going to be a, a, a pretty big number. So that kind of scaling is, you know, is a very challenging number to face. So that's a, a big thing to look at to see what, how we're going to get there. And certainly, uh, you know, when you start talking about higher speeds, uh, higher data rates, higher speeds, uh, there's no way uh, other than uh, dealing with it by make, making coverage smaller. So coverage will have to drop. So in some sense, if you want to keep your current cells, you're going to lose a link budget of 15 to 20 GB link budget. So the only way you can probably is going to be trying to make cells smaller. Uh, making cells smaller has its own difficulties and disadvantages. So you would try to try and see whether you can, you can try and bridge this link budget by some means or other. Certainly making cells smaller is one way, but, uh, but not the least painful way. So capacity and coverage will, uh, are going to become huge challenges over the next 10 years. <clears throat> so there are some constraints uh, to try and reach these two numbers we're talking about. And I sort of use a term from, from computers that it was called the power wall. Essentially, these are barriers that you've got to overcome. So the, the, the power wall, the spectrum wall, the backhaul wall, the like complexity, and battery. So these are sort of constraints or barriers that, that we really have to fight. And I'll say a few words about these. The first is, of course, is power. And uh, uh, for, let's look at base station power. The base stations, the transport power, uh, is actually a growing concern. In fact, uh, you know, there's, there's, there are standards in the United States, I'm sure in Sweden, where we talk about the field strength out in the, when you go out and walk around town and measure the field strength. There are some numbers, for example, that the U.S. has adopted. And uh, there is, uh, I'm involved with some committee in California, which uh, now believes that in some parts in, in, uh, in cities in California, like San Francisco, we already have exceeded those into safe limits. And there are others who feel that limits actually are already unsafe and they should be actually lowered further. And uh, these are some pictures from India where uh, there are lots of documentation in India to say that we are in some places a factor of 10 times higher than the safe limits of, uh, of uh, RF field strength created by towers. Uh, in fact, one in, in one building, people claim that there's more, more than 800 watts of RF power coming out from the roof, from the roof of that building. There's so many base stations out there. The government has been lax in the enforcing this stuff. So, um, so the base station, total base station power uh, and, the, and the problems of field strength, high field strength, is a, is a growing concern. Another, of course, is the transmit power from phones itself. And that's measured by a, a limit called the SAR limit, a specific absorption rate. It's a test done by, specified by FCC where you actually, when you build a phone, you actually take it to that system and you test it, make sure that you, 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 are, you, are, you, you comply with the test. And uh, for those of us who build chips, like I've done before, you spend a lot of time and energy and intellectual property trying to uh, make the test happen. You want to transport as much power as possible because uh, the carriers like that, they want to see good coverage with your phones, but uh, you don't want to exceed, you don't want to break the test. So you do lots of very interesting things to to go to, to, to comply with that test. 
And, uh, and uh, so therefore, certainly that limits the power you can tra transmit. But you can, it's a very complicated issue. It is uh, not just one number, the number of numbers involved. And you, can, you have many tools to trying to, to deal with that problem. But in general, there's a now a feeling that even that test, that SAR limit is actually two lakhs. Because they were developed 20 years ago when uh, you use only for voice and uh, the usage of phones was not so high. But now phones has become much more than a voice device. And the feeling is that uh, that, uh, that SAR has been revisited and practically been lowered. And therefore, uh, you know, the, already the constraints on power on the phones is going to get even probably worse. So it turns out power is also now a problem in computing devices, is also becoming a problem in wireless. And it turns out that these are pretty fundamental and there's no easy way of actually overcoming this problem. And therefore, when you're looking at uh, increasing density of, uh, of a data density of a factor of 100 or 1,000, this is going to become a, will become a huge problem in trying to, uh, in, in becoming a bottleneck to, for that problem. So that's the first thing. Other one is spectrum. We all know that you now getting spectrum is useful to, to, get, uh, to, get, to, get, to get capacity. And of course, finding new spectrum is not going to be easy. And we already have you know, opened up spectrum from the TV area. And, um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, when WiMAX came, we opened up 2.3, 2.5, and the 3.5 bands, which now LT also has got, uh, has, has also now has, uh, has uh, uh, band plants in that area. And, uh, but in general, uh, today I think, I think WiMAX is at 10 and 20, LT is in 20. It'll probably go higher. Uh, and HSPA now, is, now does things called dual carrier where you actually bond uh, five megahertz channels together. So in general, uh, we're trying to increase the band, the amount of spectrum that we can provide to the carriers. And often, uh, we, if, the, if the, the channels are next to each other, you can, uh, you can probably get away with, without any guard bands because the, we can keep them orthogonal. For example, they're OFDM. We can keep them on the same, the same OFDM uh, cycle. Then they can remain orthogonal and you can have no guard bands. Um, uh, but uh, if, you, if they are uh, far away and uh, you can't have a signality, which is not uh, always easy, then, of course, uh, you need to have guard bands. And particularly if we have an uncoordinated operator in between, then, of course, uh, we certainly need guard bands. And guard bands are very wasteful. And so there are a number of ways by which you can actually reduce guard bands or eliminate them. And, uh, and those become complicated. So, so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of work done in India, which I was involved with, uh, trying to uh, how to reduce the guard bands for WiMAX and LTE. And the basic idea is that uh, if you can, uh, uh, by playing a variety of tricks, you could actually uh, eliminate the need for guard bands or at least minimize them. So, uh, but all of, the come, all of this comes with, with a lot of difficulty. So the idea of finding spectrum, because you can't go to much higher bands than about two, than three gigahertz. Because beyond 3 gigahertz, the shadowing of buildings become very strong. And so mo mobile phones won't like it. There will be too many handoffs, and, uh, and certainly coverage will drop. And therefore, uh, finding spectrum below 3 gigahertz, preferably below 2 gigahertz, uh, for, for where we, we started, you know, GSM was 20, 200 kilohertz channels. At CDMA and uh, 3GPP, we went to 5 megahertz. Now we're talking about 10 and 20, and that'll go to 40 or 100. It's not going to be easy to find spectrum. And, and as you've already find that uh, uh, the uh, 2G technology like GSM doesn't go away. It, whatever band it got, is, it remains there. And 3G is going to remain there for many more years. So when 4G comes, uh, it's got to find, it's found some bands now in the low TV bands. But uh, it's very unlikely that the bands, uh, where the technology will be recycled and spectrum will be recycled. So this is going to be a big problem too. Finding spectrum is not going to be easy. <laughs> The third area of surprising problem of what I call is also a bottleneck is actually the backhaul problem. Now, of course, uh, typically today for macro base stations, something like 20% of macro base stations are touched by fiber. And of course, you have a lot of bandwidth coming in. And typically from that fiber base station, we jump spokes out, the radio spokes, to the other four or five base stations around it, it's called hub and spoke. Uh, thing. And some space stations are served by copper, you know, uh, SDH hierarchy, uh, uh, copper, copper uh, uh, T1, uh, T1 type line, NT1 lines. And, uh, uh, but radio is a dominant backhaul source. 
And these radios are typically line of sight radios. They are uh, very narrow beams, and they, they clear good frontal clearance. There's no multipath allowed. So the radios look actually almost like fiber. So you can get uh, very good links and very reliable links uh, in the system. Now, as we scale to, uh, to high capacity, we have to go to small cells. And I'll talk about that later. And typically, it's going to be pico base stations. So to, uh, for every macro base station, we may have 10 or even more or 15 pico base stations around. And those base stations are, cannot be on, be on towers because this, you can't have that many towers. And therefore, you're really going to put them on what's called street furniture, basically on lampposts, or stick them on sites of buildings. And usually, they're only about 10 or 15 feet high. And therefore, if you want to run radio backhaul to those kinds of uh, uh, radio, uh, 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 base stations, you cannot have line of sight technology. So you're going to have non-line of sight or near line, near line of sight. And, uh, and then those paths are going to intersect with traffic. So these links will not, cannot look like uh, solid links that you're used to today. But uh, if you look at the X2 interface in LTE or you look at WiMAX backhaul interfaces, they don't like that. They still want to see a very rigid uh, link. And therefore, uh, uh, how do you actually take a very bad channel and engineer that for a good link is a, is a problem. So backhaul, uh, that's one problem. Another problem is uh, these radios are, I think they're about $15,000. In some cases, they're even more expensive than the base station. And actually putting up a radio, aligning it, and all that is another three or $4,000. You can't afford that in, in Pico Base Station because the, the, the Pico Base Station itself is probably cost two or $3,000. I mean, later, no, maybe now it's 5000 today, uh, next year. And your, your backhaul radio should be around two or $3,000. Therefore, uh, uh, the question of how do you, uh, meeting those numbers, the weight cannot be very large, that is much smaller. In fact, I think the total area allowed is only about 10, or 10, 10 by 10 inches is what carriers allow. So there are lots of challenges in building these kinds of uh, backhaul technology. So that actually, if you look at, if we talk, talk to carriers I talked to in the United States, the big problem of going to small cells is really the problem of backhaul. They don't have a technology that actually works. <clears throat> the other, um, uh, another wall I would call is complexity wall. Uh, uh, the design complexity, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, uh, of these networks is getting rising very rapidly. In fact, yesterday I was uh, here for an for a oral exam of uh, Emil, uh, one of the John students, and uh, when, you, when you go through the stuff he's done, it's pretty complicated. So uh, the designing these networks and testing the, the, these networks is going to get very expensive. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, and these things are rising very rapidly. And then the, uh, once you design and test and deploy, even the problem of running the network on the uh, scheduling, doing the scheduling in that Mac layer, all the stuff you do inside the resource allocations, the pre-coding, is all very high dimensional and also often non-convex problems. So they're not hard, to, they're not easy to solve. And in fact, I had a fair amount of experience with WiMAX networks. We were building chips and we were selling into uh, many carriers, but our uh, Vendors, our base station vendors, the Samsung and, uh, and, uh, and Motorola. And we had constant problems with them because they would not open up all the features in WiMAX at the base station because they said, no, we just don't know how to make it work. We're getting, uh, it is too complicated for them to write the schedulers or make the schedulers uh, uh, work properly because of the complexity of the system. So, uh, so I think the increasing complexity of the system is also going to make the operation of the systems very complicated. And of course, in the phone, the, the complexity of a number of BIPs, a billion operations per second, is also growing, thanks to MIMO and uh, high bandwidth uh, interference cancellation. There's lots of stuff coming into these phones, apart from all the applications that we see here. And uh, so complexity is also growing. And uh, essentially, computing technology is also not growing that fast. We're running into problems because of power. So we're now going to, now, I think, we're now going to quad-core processors for phones. And, uh, and, uh, but certainly, it, it's going to be uh, an issue as the networks grow. Uh, for example, you look at uh, phones the next year, 2012, uh, the number of lines of code will be 10 to 15 million lines of code. Many processors, uh, at least, uh, for example, just the LTE chip, uh, going back to what we do, probably already had four or five processors inside it. A uh, couple of sievers, some mini arms, and then there are processors for the application processors and then the graphic processors. 
and uh, processors dealing with the audio. And uh, so it's uh, many processors, uh, multiple operating systems and hypervisors, uh, many modems, the uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, the Bluetooth, uh, uh, near field uh, communications, and then of course the, uh, the Wi-Fi, so many modems. Uh, complex graphical UIs, uh, very large user data, uh, many gigabytes of it, uh, over there download of features and functions. The modem itself will run probably 20 bips, and these, and these modems will become purely soft, almost purely soft now. The, the current LTE modem we built is, uh, except for, I think, for the turbo, or the LTPC decoders, and maybe the MIMO decoding, uh, everything else is really software. And maybe the DFT engines are also hardwired. Um, uh, the application process is about 2 gigahertz clock cycles, memory is 50 gigabytes. So these are pretty complicated animals. And uh, uh, that's just on the phone side. And the infrastructure also has a lot of complexity. So this is, uh, again, uh, a bottleneck which is going to create more costs uh, and certainly, certainly more opportunities and jobs for us, but not easy to solve. Mm. Another is, of course, is batteries. And uh, battery power density is only improving slowly. It's about a factor of two in five years, much slower than the, the so-called MOS curve. And, uh, but the drain on battery is increasing rapidly. And because of the so many functions that are going on in these phones, and I think the latest 4G phone from Apple has, has again, a, again, a battery problem. It always has battery problems. And uh, also, like I often find that uh, because of congestion of the networks, it can't find a good link back to, for downloading emails. It keeps on, you know, Trying to trying to uh, trying to get to get uh, uh, um, pull stuff down, so the batteries drain out very quickly, and uh, uh, and certainly building a, uh, building a phone with good battery life is a very complicated stuff. Uh, it's an exercise. You have to do a very careful design of many issues of systems side and software, hardware, architecture, circuits, process. And uh, I know a little bit about the about the chip side, but the phone side there are a lot many more issues involved. And uh, because the latest course, the fad, of course, is wireless charging. So that might add some, com some convenience. You don't have to plug anything in. You just put it on a pad. But nevertheless, I think batteries are not getting any better very quickly. And, uh, but, the, but the demand on the batteries are going up. So it's going to create a lot more, uh, I think, a lot more demand on my, my much more careful design of chips and phones. And probably also uh, some interesting design at the architectural level of the, of the networks itself as to how to, because the key to f the phone, uh, keeping phone power down is to make sure that phone is sleeping most of the time. It gets a quick download and can go to sleep, or even transmission, it, quick, it transmits quickly uh, in a short burst and goes to sleep. Keeping it sleeping all the time is, is a key. And the question is, how do you do that? And that has, you know, it, that, it, it is not easy to solve, uh, easy to do, but that's why we want to do it. <clears throat> so the, I talked about problems, so I now talk a little bit about uh, you know, what are the things that we can throw this? Uh, so, so most of those problems, of course, are not at the layer of the file layer, the layer of actually the modem layer. So I'm now shifting to the modem layer and saying that uh, uh, what can we do there? Are there opportunities for us to buy capacity and coverage? And uh, so broadly, these are, most of you in the field know, these are the kind of tools we have. On the capacity side, we have bandwidth we can throw. We can go to smaller cells, cell splitting, which is a good way to get capacity. Certainly, interference is an area where you know, a lot of good things are being done, but that's a source of buying capacity, interference management. And on coverage, you know, use of relays, uh, buying in more diversity, which combats fading, therefore always gives you, will give you better coverage. Uh, and buying antenna aperture, so if you can, the, uh, by, if you collect more, more, more energy by a bigger antenna, uh, you can certainly you know, get link budget, uh, link budget gains. And things like scheduling, MIMO, beam forming also provide both capacity and coverage. So these are the typical tools. I'll have a few remarks to make on, on these tools. <clears throat> so let's look at cell splitting and uh, heterogeneous networks. HetNet is heterogeneous networks. And in general, I think uh, as we go from macro cells to pico cells, uh, small cells, both cells will, will have to coexist. In fact, already macrocells and femtos coexist, and they have their own problems. Uh, but femtos may not be that uh, popular, I think, as you go forward, because uh, Wi-Fi access points probably will serve a lot of those purposes. But certainly, if, uh, macros and picos uh, will have to coexist. And uh, the fast-moving traffic will be parked on the macrocells, and the pedestrian traffic will be parked on pico cells. And hopefully, most of the traffic is going to be on pedestrian. So so that's where the capacity will come from. 
So cell splitting uh, uh, can actually buy capacity because the capacity of one cell doesn't change with when it gets smaller. But of course, you run into some problems like a power wall. The fact is that if you go from one, one cell to four cells, so you certainly have uh, four times the power. You might, of course, say the cells have got smaller, so I can less, I use less power. Technically, you should be able to use uh, 12 dB less power because the, the radius has come down to half. But the problem is that uh, the cell, the base station heights have come down too. And when that happens, you get additional path loss. So it turns out that the amount of power you put out in a pico cell in a base or a macro cell may not be that different. And therefore, you actually may increase the power density in a, in a system by going to small cells rather than actually reduce it. So you may run into power problems. And of course, the backhaul problem. Backhauls are already an expensive proposition in macro cells, but they really are not very well, so even a solved proposition in, in pico cells. So these are, are not easy to do from the point of, at least on those two points of view. So het nets, of course, uh, is where you have a combination of these cells. And how do you manage all these uh, inter inter intercell handoffs of upper layer to lower layer? And there's also issues about organizing these things, self-organizing networks. So there are, I think, uh, there are a lot of people working on these ideas, but none of them come easily. So there are lots of issues to be solved here at, at a conceptual and a practical level. But there are some serious problems with power and backhaul issues at, on cell splitting. So, so this certainly this will be probably the most powerful way to get capacity, but they come with, uh, with problems which are not easily solved, so we'll have to do it carefully. Other question is adding bandwidth. So clearly adding bandwidth should buy, should buy the additional capacity. But unfortunately, if you are already at max power, which you are often in a radio like this, uh, wider bandwidth doesn't buy, buy, buy data. Because for example, if you're at low CNR, uh, increasing, throwing bandwidth doesn't increase data rate. And, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, it's a source of, uh, bandwidth is not necessarily a, source of the, a solution to the problem. So in uplink, for example, uh, you, know, you have a fixed amount of power. So if you're already using, let's say, 1 megahertz, you give it say, 10 megahertz. If you're sitting at already at uh, 3 dB SNR, uh, 1 to 10, your data rate cannot go up. Because, for example, here, if you're at, say, 3 dB SNR, and you have doubled your bandwidth, you know, you'll, you'll drop 3 dB in your, in your, in your power spectral density. So you lose 1 bits per hertz there, and, but, you, but you, you only double here. So you don't gain anything. If you're sitting at six bits per hertz or seven bits per hertz, then doubling bandwidth helps. But you're sitting, already sitting at one or two, doubling bandwidth doesn't help. And uh, so basically, if we increase bandwidth, what can, we can support more users in the system. Each one is keeping the same bandwidth. But one guy cannot use the bandwidth effectively because he doesn't have the power. He doesn't have power to use the bandwidth. On the downlink, uh, if again, if you have a, if a capped on power, if you give him more power, more bandwidth. Once again, uh, he can't really serve cell edge people. So if you have, you have a power problem, bandwidth is not that useful. It's, I'm not saying it's completely useless, but it's not that useful. So you have to be careful uh, about the role, how, how much bandwidth can buy you. If you're looking at a factor of 100 and 1,000, you know, bandwidth is not going to buy you very much. <clears throat> the other, of course, is relays, which is largely a, a coverage uh, solution. And uh, uh, sometimes maybe some throughput too. And they too run into problems of uh, power because uh, really have to transmit power. They add to the power problems. And of course, they're usually complicated to deploy because they, they further complicate the whole problem of uh, optimizing these networks. But uh, deployments of relays have been very limited. At least in WiMAX, uh, nothing really happened at all. No, no carrier, no infrastructure builder was prepared to build it. And LTE has relay proposals. I'm not really sure you know, what's happening there. I, I'm more, more, more involved with the, with the chips on the client side. But, uh, but uh, I'm always sus suspicious about relays because uh, in general, relays were very popular 30, 25 years ago in the United States because uh, coverage was a big issue and, uh, and relays solved the problem. But then when, uh, and those days, base station electronics was very expensive. And relay was, uh, base station electronics were $200,000, relay maybe $25,000, it made sense to put a relay. But when BTS electronics came down to $25,000, uh, putting up a relay, the tower, and getting all the real estate for the tower was not worthwhile. So all the relay companies died out and relays have disappeared. So it's not clear that they will actually play a big role going forward because 
If we have, because in the US, for example, I believe the number is average base station cost is $450,000, of which $400,000 is for the real estate, the lawyer fees, litigation, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, 30 or 40 thousand dollars for the electronics. So after paying all that money, uh, you may still put a base station, you can get coverage and capacity. So really, it may never be uh, uh, may never be a big part, big player in the whole thing. But uh, uh, certainly, in the area of our research, there are many promising theoretical ideas, and uh, you know, I'm sure we have a lot of you work in KTH in this area, and I had a couple of students also in this area earlier. But I'm always suspicious as to how big the role they'll play in practical systems. One, one country which is very fond of relays is Korea. And, uh, and we had a lot of problems working with them in Korean networks because uh, uh, we would, uh, uh, this, is, this is with Vimac chipsets, they would have relays fed by fiber, fiber feeds. And, uh, and we would see uh, enormous delay spreads coming in uh, into the system. And for some reason, there was a phased role on this, in this system. So uh, it was nightmare making those modems work on the Korean network, so I don't like relays. <clears throat> okay, then of course is reuse, a thing that, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, you know, the first idea of uh, reuse goes back to, was the, the origin of cellular networks was uh, two guys at Bell Labs, uh, Young and Ring and Young, I think, Doug Ring and uh, Ray Young, so their idea was to have this, uh, you can, you only have sort of limited frequencies, so you can uh, divide up a city into small cells, and then if you allow the same frequency to be used in, in cells which are far apart, then you control interference, and therefore you can reuse the frequency again and again. And uh, so that's how cellular ideas were born. And today, of course, these have evolved, and, uh, and we have, uh, basically we have most uh, reuse ideas today in Vimax and LTE are what are called static reuse, so we create, a, uh, and we can have, we can have a reuse of, uh, we can have no reuse between sectors, or we can have full reuse within sectors. In general, what happens is that uh, there are some users who are within the sector, close, close by to the base station, or well within the sector. They can be reused again and again because uh, they're well protected by the sector, sector uh, beam former, uh, beam pattern. Uh, but, uh, but if you're sector edge or you are cell edge, then you have more interference. So they could be then be in, in, on a reuse, uh, in a lower reuse. And then, of course, you can also do things like ICIC, with intercell interference coordination, where you can also do these things, but it can also have different power levels, so that will also help you. So there are a number of static ideas which come into LTE and Vimax, and, and I think they're well, well understood. But there's another way of looking at it. I had a couple of PhD theses looking at it at Stanford. What I call it dynamic reuse, but I'm not sure that it's the right word. And the idea there was just, uh, just a simple idea that was follow, following. That is, uh, uh, if you take one resource block, for example, in LTE, or just one resource in frequency and time, you might ask the question saying that, uh, can I find two users in the resource, for that resource, I can put in the same resource, who are mutually not interfering? And uh, for example, let's assume I'm forming a beam to a, this, this guy. He's going to have natural nulls of, uh, of interference in the other cell, other sector. And I can find a, a user in that sector who I can support who has a natural null towards this guy, then I can support both these guys uh, without any interference at all because they are naturally you know, orthogonal. And, uh, but you have to build this idea out more carefully. And uh, the whole idea of dynamic reuse was to, instead of creating bins and then assigning users to bins, here you actually uh, you sort of invert the problem and you bunch users together who, are, who are, don't interfere naturally together uh, very strongly. It turns out these problems are all non-convex, so, so you have to use very complicated ways of finding these guys and doing this properly. But it seems a way to go, and I think we have some numbers to show that if you go from here to here, you can buy some capacity. Not a whole lot, but some capacity, but at a very high level of complexity, uh, 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 inputs are required. <clears throat> then, of course, is the MIMO, the block cluster idea, which um, um, uh, which was, I think the original idea of spatial multiplexing was proposed actually at Stanford, I think around the time when uh, Bjorn was there. Bjorn was pushing another idea called SDMA, which now is sometimes called multi-user MIMO. So both the uh, uh, very similar ideas came from that group at that same point in time. MIMO, uh, so you're on that pattern, right, Bjorn? Uh, the SDMA pattern. And um, so the MIMO idea came from a slightly different thing. In fact, uh, when, we, when SDMA was being looked at, one problem with SDMA, which was worrying me, was that 
you needed to know the channel on the downlink. And, uh, and uh, that day, we were, we were looking at AMP's system. AMP's had no way of feeding back information by which you could do downlink beam forming. So, uh, so downlink beam forming was a kind of a showstopper for, uh, for AMP's. So the question was, can you get increased throughput without knowing the downlink channel? And that's how the idea of SD of uh, MIMO came, where it turns out that you can get parallel channel, you can get increase in throughput without knowing channels by, uh, by the, uh, if you can do the uh, coordination of decoding at, at, at the receivers together. And uh, so and initially, but uh, it's interesting that uh, when we proposed the idea to DARPA and NSF for funding, they wouldn't fund it. They would not believe it actually works. But finally, uh, Bell Labs did a lot of fundamental work and then it took off. Now the question, of course, is now in every standard, such as PA Plus has it, uh, WiMAX and LT have it, and certainly uh, Wi-Fi also has it. Now the question is, where is MIMO going forward? One question is, can you go to higher order MIMO? Now, LT talks about eight antennas, uh, eight by eight MIMO, but I'm not sure you know, when this will get there. Uh, uh, LT, you know, WiMAX, we've done two, two by two. I don't think it'll go beyond two by two. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, a lot of questions we answered at that point, because uh, uh, can phones support um, higher order MIMO? Does the channel really support it? Uh, what happens with the issue of blocking by the head, blocking by a hand? So there's some work going on, I know in Broadcom, looking at these problems more carefully. But certainly, idea of a much, much, much smarter antenna design, uh, MEMS antennas, uh, uh, are, all, are all to play. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, I think uh, there's also some ideas which, which came out of Bangalore, which says that if you have higher order MIMO and low, uh, low rate uh, encoding like BPSK, you could actually decode these systems very fast with iterative methods. Uh, and uh, so, so there are lots of point, interesting pointers to sort of going towards higher order MIMO, and I think they will be realized, but a lot of work to be done on antennas. And interestingly, in WiMAX, uh, we were, I was greatly surprised that uh, uh, we were uh, actually building, uh, I remember building uh, uh, USB dongles in, for WiMAX, where the antenna spacing was one eighth of a lambda. And we got perfect channel decorrelation. And uh, so it's remarkable. I think the way we did that, uh, we, we didn't design antennas, designed by another house. But, uh, but by having pattern, uh, the, 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 the beam patterns were somewhat orthogonal. I think that gave them the ability to be, uh, to be, uh, to be uncorrelated. So lambda by two was no mean needed, uh, was, 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 too, too, was very high. You can today do it at, uh, by very clever ant designs, you can get down to much closer than lambda by two. And uh, therefore, uh, there's, no, there's no reason why we can't put, put 30 or 40 antennas on this guy and do very interesting things. Not only you buy more coverage because you have a lot more uh, capture, but you've got to deal with the, all the other, other underlying problems. And, uh, and I think it will we'll get there. But there are lots of engineering problems to be solved there. The other thing that is happening is network MIMO, something called COMP, Coordinated MIMO Transmission. This is going to happen in LT release, uh, release 11, 11, 11, and 12. And I think a lot of ideas are already out there. And uh, a lot of work has been done in, uh, in KTH. KT, I saw a demo this morning uh, with, uh, Lars, uh, with, uh, with uh, Per Zetterberg. And, um, and yesterday's thesis was looking at this problem. So this is going to happen. But once again, I think uh, I have a suspicion that uh, we will build these systems uh, at, uh, uh, perhaps at the, at the chip level, but the carriers themselves may not actually deploy them for a long time because uh, they'll have so many other problems to solve, as I found in WiMAC, that uh, these all the advanced methods they've already put off saying that we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it later. Because uh, when, they, when you turn these on, they create new dimensions of problems which are which are very complicated actually to sort of uh, optimize and tune. So uh, these good ideas, I think, are, will take many years. LT, I think, will take uh, at least 10 years to mature to a really mature system. So they're still far out from reality, but I think the technical problems, uh, at least the, the standards will get set soon. I'm, I'm sure chips will appear, but uh, deployment in the real world will take time. <clears throat> so. The next two slides, uh, this slide just talks about you know, a very vast area, saying that you know, what we do in, in, uh, in wireless is uh, we do a lot of very interesting things. Uh, we, of course, we have, this is one cell talking to a subscriber, it means dealing with multiple subscribers. And we have many cells working together. There could be sectors within the same cell, or there could be different cells. And uh, they're cross-interfering with each other. They're serving their own subscribers. And there are a lot of things that can be done in this area. 
And uh, so we, quad we can do a lot of coordination within a, within a cell, between the antennas, for example, or between cells. And, uh, and, uh, and we can do many things in the area of reuse, power allocation, pre-coding. Uh, so lots of things can be done. And everything requires some additional, additional knowledge. Uh, knowledge of what I call as uh, state information, channel state information. So you, want, you may know, want to know something about how the signal is behaving, how the interference is behaving, what are the signals at the interference levels. You want to know the channel directions of signal and interference, uh, interference avoidance and cancellation ability of the subscriber. This guy may be able to cancel interference, may not be able to cancel interference. And uh, things like packet error tolerance, it turns out that uh, if this is a, a, it's not voice call and if it's really a data call, uh, he can quite easily support uh, 20% packet error rate because you can only retransmit and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and close, this, close the link. Then he's, uh, we can take some big bets and actually uh, try something very, very ambitious to try and give him a hybrid rate. He may not make it, but if he makes it, then you're, luck, you're lucked out. If he doesn't make it, then you can retransmit back to him. So, that, so there are lots of, there are maybe 20 or 30 or 40 knobs that you have. And, uh, and playing with those knobs uh, is how you actually optimize the bandwidth. But it's very complicated. And, uh, uh, and therefore, I think the, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, the sheer complexity of the system is mind-boggling. And uh, even when you look at it from a theoretical PhD point of view, it's hard enough. But in reality, you're dealing with many more dimensions that we cannot handle, we do not handle in a, in a, in a, in a research paper. So when you put all that together, it's very difficult. So I'm skeptical about how long, the, how, 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 before, how long these things will take to get adopted. And therefore, I think we need to find a way by which we can cut through this complexity and, uh, and, uh, and see it in some interestingly simpler way so that uh, we can design systems, uh, we can deploy systems which are, deplo we can design systems which are deployable. Otherwise, we will build complexity and the carriers will not actually turn it on because they said they can't figure out how to make it work. <clears throat> I think in WiMAX, they found that you turn on some knobs very interesting, the capacity would drop uh, because it's not optimized. So some of these things are double-edged sword. They would actually buy capacity if they're done well. Not done well, they actually damage capacity. <clears throat> so I'll just give some examples of you know, where you can actually go. And for example, take reuse. Uh, if you took it, the idea of reuse is that uh, somebody being served in one cell, that resource can be used in another cell again and again. And uh, so where are we today in 4G, which is LTE or WiMAX? Um, we actually, in the whole idea of reuse, we don't take into account the multiple antenna technology that we have. So for example, an ability of, of a user to actually cancel interference is not really taken into account today in the how to use is structured. So that dimension is not used. And uh, the fact that you know this, uh, the channel state information, the directional information of the channel, is, or you certainly have it for your own users, uh, you may, have, may not have it for interferers, you may have some of it, that is not probably used. And if it, uh, the fact that you're serving multiple users within your own cell, it's called multi-user MIMO, also impacts how reuse is structured, and that's not used. So today, 4G, uh, the reuse ideas, ICIC and all the ideas, are very simplistic ideas. It doesn't use all the levers, and I've got more, many more levers I haven't mentioned here. So just reuse can be actually made much more complex, much more sophisticated, and hopefully more effective if we can bring all the levers in. But the problem, of course, is complexity. So a lot more can be done, but at a high complexity cost. <clears throat> and here's another example of the transport encoding. It's a broad idea of encoding is that uh, at the transmitter, whether there are antennas at the same base station or you're dealing with antennas from multiple base stations as, as one unit, you can do very interesting things with those things. Now the question is, of, uh, take for example, channel state information. Uh, often today, uh, you only assume that you know something about the, your, your own target subscriber. The knowledge of interference is not normally taken into account. So current 4G at the most talks only about uh, uh, all your transfer encoding fundamentally is focused on your knowledge of your own subscriber, not about uh, global knowledge of interferers. And um, the um, uh, and you take, for example, uh, uh, information uh, available to you is to, without in, in release nine and ten. Certainly, it's only about local information. You know nothing about what's happening, what other cells are seeing from your own about your own subscriber. So mostly locally oriented, not global. And multi-user. Uh, also, the, 
uh, the, the pre -code, transparent encoding for multi-user, uh, at least WiMAX, uh, it turned out that uh, did not and did not uh, did not support on downlink uh, multi-user only uplink. So again, I, I said no for that. So once again, I think there are many dimensions that can be opened up to make transparent coding more more uh, more uh, powerful. And certainly, some of it will happen in release 11, release 12, and release 13 as you go forward. But there are many dimensions to be exploited, again, at high complexity. <clears throat> then, of course, scheduling is a very important thing, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, once again, a complicated thing to do. But scheduling the link level is really to say that you have some resource and frequency and time, and who are you going to give the resources to? So it refers to assignment of a resource to a user time slot, a frequency subchannel, or a spatial signature to users. It's very powerful when you combine with all the things that goes on in the system. It's a very powerful way of uh, scheduling, a powerful way of actually buying, uh, you know, reducing interference and buying all the good things that, that you can buy. And it can be coordinated locally or coordinated globally, but it's been very difficult to do. Uh, for example, many ideas that we had in scheduling in WiMAX, I don't think uh, certainly ClearWire in the United States, KDDI in Japan, none of them have turned them, turned them on because they all find that uh, it's too complicated to actually implement. So for a simple thing in WiMAX called Band AMC, so when you have a bunch of carriers assigned to a user transmitting upwards, either you can, you can spread those, or, uh, those carriers around the full channel to buy some diversity, or you can keep them together and, and you assign the best sub-channel, that's called multi-user it's called multi -user diversity, uh, some of you may know the technical word, but uh, the channel is freaking selective, and you assign to that sub-band sub where the channel is strongest. Simple idea, not much to do, the uh, sample chipset that I developed to uh, support it, but no base station guys have turned it on. They said they can't solve, the, they, the scheduling is too complicated for them. Because in just in their current scheduling, they have so many conflicts resolved that this thing, which may give them a half a dB more throughput, is not worth the complexity. So, so scheduling is a good idea, but complicated scheduling is, is complex to do. <clears throat> Other scheduling at the application levels uh, are also being looked at. Um, one is sort of predictive based on access patterns and geography, or delayed assignment of resources to reduce congestion. For example, you know, the idea is here is that uh, it may know by learning that uh, uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning, you're going to open up and look at the New York Times. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and if everybody does it at the same time, it's going to create a congestion. So, it can, for example, delay your access. Uh, it'll probably download it for you and cache it for you a little earlier because it knows that half an hour later you want to look at it. So things like that. You can do very interesting things about delaying things or predicting things by which you can actually uh, you can spread the congestion on the network uh, to try and avoid the peaks of uh, congestion, mostly on the downlink. Or you can also do pooling of downlink access and use broadcast mode. So, for example, it knows that, for example, if there's a cricket match in India and a lot of people can look at the same thing, it can do some pooling by which it can put those, those, that kind of data on the broadcast mode. So people don't have, to, you don't have to provide the individual access mode and use bandwidth. So there are a number of ideas around the whole idea of scheduling at the application level. Some of it may already be coming into networks, but there are scope for many more good ideas over here. <clears throat> so, so just kind of wrapping up here. The, so what are the, we're looking at these tools, what are we doing today in 4G? Uh, WiMAX release 8, 9, 12, we're doing kind of local MIMO, but MIMO based on antennas that your own cell, uh, mostly local scheduling information on local, uh, on your cell information, nothing about other cells. Maybe fixed reuse, ICIC, which is inter intercell interference coordination, some interference avoidance and cancellation, of OFTMA or DFT OFTMA. So that's where we are today. Moving forward, release, uh, release 11 and 12, uh, we're going to bring multi-band or multi-carrier type ideas. Uh, Infrastructure delays in the system. WiMAX is not going to do it, or uh, LT. I'm not clear. Uh, Multi-cell coordinated multi-point transmission is going to come in. Network MIMO will come in. I mean, certainly come in the standard. It's not clear when it'll be deployed. Dirty paper coding. Uh, this uh, standard will support it or already supports it. And globally coordinated scheduling is a buzzword. It's not clear how much of that will get implemented. And moving forward, for, you know, many more years forward, I think client relay, the phones can do some relaying for you. It's a long, old subject, but it may finally happen. 
advanced information management where I talked a little bit earlier, there are a lot more tools that we have still not looked at. Some of that can come in, uh, dynamic reuse and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, clearly, it, we, I think we have some idea of what will happen in the next two, three years. Beyond that, it's still, still research. So in summary, um, um, so basically, mobile wireless will have to offer huge throughput improvements. It's not easy. I think cell splitting is, the, is going to be the, the main source of such improvements. Adding bandwidth may help a little bit, but uh, certainly increasing the physical layer will probably, and scheduling may buy a factor of two or three more. So it could come from various areas, and uh, so we have to put a lot of tools to try and buy that factor of 100 improvement in throughput that you're going to see. So new technologies offer some promise, but make networks very complex to design and manage. So that's the key underlying factor, that the cost of buying uh, capacity from the, from the layer one, layer two, comes with high complexity. So many opportunities for innovation, I think one of the innovations I think we have to try and look at is how to cut through this complexity and make it easy to, easy to sort of uh, optimize uh, the network. And I think if we don't do that, a lot of these ideas will remain on the shelf. <clears throat> So finally, I wanted to say something about where Broadcom is, but uh, I had a bunch of slides, but they, they asked me to scrub everything. They, they said it's not publicly disclosable. So I'll say something about WiMAX, uh, the stuff that I was doing. So basically, uh, we started WiMAX, uh, the company we see in 19, 2004. Uh, we were in the fourth generation chip when we actually got acquired by Broadcom. So this is the 350 chip, it's fourth generation. We shipped about 12 million of those chips. It's 40 megabits, 40 megabits, uh, HAC 7. HAC 7, HAC means uh, hybrid ARQ. It's a technology within uh, WiMAX. So it's 40 megabits uh, uh, per user. That can decode 40 megabits at a time, burst decoding. It also works with a uh, number of other chips for in these, in these modems. So it works with Qualcomm chips and with Broadcom chips. It's 60 chip nanometer, and it's got integrated RF, RF technology. It's now launching in four smartphones and tablets uh, with Sprint and KDDI. And of course, now we're building LTE chips. We have one already in the market. Uh, one more is really coming out next year. But uh, Broadcom doesn't want to talk too much about that here. So with that, I think I'm sort of done. So thank you very much. <clears throat>